Good morning and welcome to another episode of We're Burning Daylight. I'm Belinda Haddock and I'm one of the staff pastors at Hope Church in Lavernia, Texas, right here. In fact, you may recognize that I'm standing in our gazebo at the park. So a nice fitting place to be on this beautiful day and to be able to proclaim the word of God to you and so and to be able to share it and to read it together with you. Um, as you know, we're going through the devotion where um, Live Dead Joy from or by Dick Brogdon. And so today for today's reading, we've got our four areas to read in scripture. That's going to change really soon. Um, since we are in Malachi, as far as the tail end of the Old Testament, in the next coming days or so, we're actually going to drop to just reading three portions of scripture for several weeks and then right at the very end of the year um, we're going to have another few entries where we're basically going to just um, read just a tiny bit back into the Old Testament right before we finish out the year. But how incredible, what an amazing journey it has been and those of you who have um, bought the book and you've been reading along with us, uh, reading in the in the scripture as well as in the devotion. Um, I don't know how, I don't know if you know this, but this is my sixth year going through it. And every year I keep thinking, okay, I'm going to look into another Bible reading plan. I always like to read through the Bible in the year. This, as you probably have figured out, is is that and then some, uh, because we are reading through the Gospels over and over again and other areas on multiple occasions. But, um, and so I think I'm gonna do another plan, I'm gonna do a different devotion, et cetera, et cetera. And I just keep coming back to this and um, I just find such um, value in not only the reading, how it's structured, but then of course the, the insights that Dick Brogdon brings in Live Dead Joy to, to the reading that we've had. So anyway, I can't tell you what I'm gonna do next year, but uh, I think we all probably know. <laughs> <laughs> what that's going to be, but we'll see, right? I'm, I'm willing for the Lord to lead however he desires. But for now, we are doing this together and I'm excited about that. So today I am going to skip the reading in Psalm. We're going to go right into Malachi chapter two. And so let's go ahead and read there. And now this admonition is for you, O priests. If you do not listen and if you do not set your heart to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them because you have not set your heart to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. And this is pretty rough right here. I will spread on your faces the ophel from your festival sacrifices and you will be carried off with it. Ugh. And you will know that I have sent you this admonition so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This is called, this called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge and from his mouth men should seek instruction because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty. But you have turned from the way and by, sorry, flipping the page, by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in matters of the law. Have we not all one father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with one another? Judah has broken faith. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, whoever he may be, may the Lord cut him off from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings offerings to the Lord Almighty. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears, you weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why, 
It's because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the Lord made them one? In flesh and spirit they are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, and I hate a man's covering, and I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garment, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. All right, so this may be the only, well, it's definitely the only time that we're literally going from one chapter to the next and we're hopping from Old Testament to New. Uh, and so we're going back into Matthew where we've been reading. And now we're picking up in chapter 19. I'm going to begin at verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? I ha haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Hey, we just read that in Malachi, right? So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Others were made that way by men and others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. And then our final reading today in the scripture is going to begin in Hebrews chapter one. So here's something really quick. Um, news you can use. Um, this is something that you probably are familiar with or maybe not. Uh, something I learned today and so I want to share that with you in case it might be helpful. So when going into any chapter in the Bible, even if you're in the middle of it, um, but ideally even before you begin, it's always good to reference, okay, what what is this book about? Where is this going? If known, who was the author? What's the time frame? That might be a lot of you know details that that you may seem or you may you may not feel are relevant or important, but it may help you as you continue to read the Word of God to understand the context that this was being uh, presented. Who who was the original initial audience for this word? We know that it's living and active. We know that it speaks to us today as well, but understand that there was, a, you know, that initial audience that this was written for. And so as we're beginning uh, Hebrews, I wanted to remind you, there's th three different ways you can kind of get, well, probably more than three, right? But three that I wanted to share. One is if your Bible has an introduction section, um, go to it. That's usually right there at the beginning of every chapter and read what it has to say about the book that you're going into. The other two are digital. And so I have I have my iPad today just to give you an example. So um, if you are using the YouVersion Bible app, and, uh, and there's so many resources with that, so many different translations, as well as um, videos and devotions, all kinds of stuff. But if you're using it, I recommend that, um, that you look at what they have. They also have an intro 
at least um, I know for sure in the NIV version it does, but um, you can always look at different translations and see what um, intros they might have for them. But here's this one that I didn't even know about and I'm glad that I found it because it was really helpful and also very creative in terms of displaying the, the information about the book. So let me show you my screen here. I just did some quick, quick screenshots and hopefully I don't destroy everything I'm doing here. Sorry for the wobbly screen. Okay, so there, I'll keep it like that. So there's my screenshot of Hebrews chapter one. If you look right there, oh, look what I just did. If you look right there in the corner, there is a, a compass right there. I won't touch it this time. There's a compass. If you tap on that compass, then below it's going to give you a screen like this and it'll tell you related, um, related items, or what does it say? Related videos in this case. And there's this video here that is produced by a Bible project. Here's a little screenshot of it there too. And Bible project does, they really do a fantastic job. Again, it's very visual, so if you like that kind of thing, um, but it also helps you to get that big story or the big idea of what each book of the Bible is about as you go into it. So long story long, those are three different options of ways that you can look into what does uh, this particular book in the Bible, what is it about, where are we going in it, and, um, and go from there. <gasps> look, I think I lost my bookmark. Okay, so like I said, we're starting in Hebrews, so that's easy enough, right? Chapter one. Okay, here we go. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he, provide, after he had provided purification from, for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says he makes his angels winds, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above companions, above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. And there's more to read there, but just as a quick insight, um, so the whole book of Hebrews is laying out for believers who are of Jewish descent to understand that Jesus is God. And so it spells out and it goes back into the Old Testament. In fact, some of what we just read were quotes that the author had from a lot of from Psalms of quoting certain things to begin his um, argument, if you will, to say that Jesus is not just a prophet or a really great guy or a great teacher, but the fundamental truth that we understand as believers, as Christians, is that he is God in the flesh. And so um, you'll see more of that as we read in Hebrews and dig deeper into it, as well as uh, chapters there towards the end that remind us to stay faithful, to stay grounded in the truth about who Jesus is, um, despite obstacles and persecutions and trouble that comes our way, and to be reminded of other heroes of the faith who did the same. All right, so enough about that. I need to get into the devotion before we run out of time together here and it's called godly offspring there is nothing so radiant as a woman who knows that her husband cherishes and adores her there is nothing so comforting to a man as the assurance that he is the unique pride of his bride faithfulness between spouses is one of the most life-giving forces on earth even as it is increasingly rare a pure marriage is one of the best representations we have of god's love 
marriage is sacred because it reveals God's heart to all people and has power for spiritual procreation. God brings a man and a woman together in a binding relationship that provides the best environment for raising spiritual giants. The brokenness of humanity does not limit God in his greatness. When a man and a woman are faithful to each other and to Jesus, this is the breeding ground of the saints. It is not injurious to the principle to apply it to spiritual children. A godly marriage is one of the most powerful weapons of a frontier missionary. When a man and a woman are selflessly devoted to each other under the lordship and blessings of Christ, they are a formidable force in the spiritual realm. Godly marriages do more to penetrate the darkness of unreached peoples than we realize, which is one reason marriage is increasingly under satanic attack. Spiritual warfare is more often experienced in the privacy of the home than in the marketplace. Satan, crafty as he is, knows that he can undermine the mission and ministry if he can break the marriage. Sexual sin is but the visible fruit of a hidden disease. Sexual faithfulness is but the minimum of our covenant promise. A darkness devouring marriage does not simply avoid the maximum sins, Matthew 19, 1 through 9, but is full of joy, life, truth, honesty, trust, and mutual love. God's word to those who want their marriage to endure with his endorsement is take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth, Malachi 2.15. Godly offspring, which is disciples from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, depend more on healthy marriages than they do on strategy, language learning, courage, and miracles. The real miracle is a marriage that soars above the, all the slings and arrows of the outrageous devil, which means that church planting is primarily done at home. Wow. I pray this word has been challenging and encouraging to you today. Um, again, this has been We're Burning Daylight. My apologies for going a little long on this one, but hopefully some helps there as far as um, each chapter of the Bible and looking into some intros and videos, things like that, that can be helpful and, um, and encouraging for you as you continue to journey through the word with us. May you have a blessed day and Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow.